the ones that were uploaded at the very last moment were not the ones that were written at the very last moment. So, um, go figure. Uh, so anyway, back to Jeff's slides. And the Chromebook is behaving oddly, so hopefully we'll get something something useful. Um, so Ronnie is taking notes in the Etherpad. Um, if you have a, a, a second person to watch that same Etherpad and fix anything he overlooks would not be a bad thing. If anybody wants to volunteer, uh, Bo, okay. And since I ha have far too many laptops on the, on the table, I can't actually pay attention to uh, the Jabber. So if anybody, we do have, and we do have remote participants. So if anybody wants to be, anybody in the, want to be in the Jabber room? Uh, anybody own a Jabber client that still works? <laughs> what? Um, well, I can keep an eye on it. And, anyway, and yeah, Bernard will be presenting remotely, so we need to actually. So, um, blue sheets should be going around. Maybe you've already gone around. You don't. If you don't see them, figure out where they are. We'll figure that out at the end. And we have to get a recording. Note well. Um, note it well. The word wrapping here is fascinating, but the content should be correct. It's the old version. Oh dear. Well. It's the old version. <laughs> look up the. Oh yeah. I think uh, this. This. Uh, yeah. This one doesn't have the. Um, the ombudsman stuff. So. So, but find another slide deck and note that well. <laughs> uh, agenda. Yes. Yeah. The amount of page destruction we have on my agenda. Yes, right. So, um, so our agenda, which has been, had a few, a number, several things added to it at the very last moment because. We discovered we had more to talk, people. We had more to talk about that people didn't tell us about until the. But you know, hopefully, we'll actually get through it all. And we have no new published documents since last time. We still have three things that are sitting in cluster two thirty eight, which hopefully should clear real soon now. And um, one thing that's blocking in another document of ours, which we'll be talking about. Uh, we have removed multipath RTP because nobody was interested in working on it. Um, yeah, we can, if somebody does come back and is interested, we can resurrect it. Um, we had, uh, let's see, we'll talk about frameworking on the next slide and multiplex guidelines. Does anybody want to say what the status of multiplex guidelines is? Who's, who's actually writing that? Is that Magnus? Magnus. Yeah, Ronnie, you're the editor now, aren't you? <laughs> Uh, so I think it sounds like both Magnus and Ronnie thought the other one should have worked on done something on it. <laughs> I think yeah, Ronnie. This is Ben. I'm hearing that uh, Ronnie and Magnus are going to get together, talk about it, and report back. That sounds like an excellent <laughs> yeah. plan. So, <laughs> all right. So, frame marking. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the authors on for, on multiplex guidelines will talk this week and figure out what to say. Uh, frame marking, is Mo here yet? Nope. Mo is not here yet. So Mo <laughs> pushed an update, um, I think, at the very, you know, the day after the draft deadline because of GitHub was down, even though he's not in GitHub because I nagged him. Um, this is following the um, working group last call. So people who had comments in working group last call, which is, I think, mostly me and Magnus, should read over the changes and see if his art comments were reflected um, and follow up on the list. Oh, I think I see Mo outside. That looks like a small Mo silhouette there. Oh, he left. I think he's going, he's going to the other door. Okay. Somebody make sure the door isn't. Uh, uh, it is Mo, oh, excellent, just in time. He's... I'm talking about frame marking. <laughs> <clears throat> you want me to go there? Just... Uh, so we had uh, feedback from uh, 
<clears throat> Magnus, Jonathan, uh, Ronnie, and uh, I think maybe one or two other folks. And so we updated all of that feedback in uh, oh, 08. <clears throat> and that should be the end of all the feedback the, the authors are aware of. So I think we're <clears throat> ready to progress this. Uh, m most of the changes were editorial. Um, the, uh, the, the one I should probably call out is uh, <clears throat> There was a, a TL0 pick index. Um, there was a note that it was uh, valid to have zero as a valid running index. And so there's a question about whether or not, <clears throat> uh, if it's unknown, is it valid to still mark it as zero? And so we updated the text to say, if it's unknown, you actually must omit it so that, that a receiver can be aware whether it's Does truly omit unknown or. The short form or what does omit mean? Omit me. Uh, so I, we actually clarified the text to say omit means. A, lo a reduced length. So omit means truly remove it and reduce the length field. So it's not in the payload at all. <clears throat> um, and uh, there was also a, uh, a point about um, LRR uh, since uh, we updated the, the restriction frame marking that you can only use it for temporally nested streams. So LRR temporal layer refresh is really never needed because the, the streams are always uh, self-refreshing because they're nested. Um, but that, that raises an issue that is this restriction okay for for future needs? Um, and I'm, I'm aware of a few, I'm, I'm aware of some work that um, that is not planning to do um, nested streams in the, in the restrictive way that frameworking currently says. So that's, to me, that's the only open issue, whether or not people have an opinion of is that too restrictive or not? Um, so <clears throat> I feel like sort of what the question is is a little bit vague. So would you be able to send the all to the list sort of describing what the that open issue is so we can make sure that yep. um, we have because unfortunately I, I'm I what was I there's it's I, I feel like there's some concern that this doesn't solve all the problems people have. And the question is, does this solve some of the problems that some people have and is still useful or does it not solve enough problems for anybody and is thus a waste of time or needs to be enhanced? So I think that's the big. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah, we don't want to progress this if then we have a abyss, you know, you know, six weeks, six months later, um, mm -hmm because a, a new payload format wants to do, or even existing payload formats want to do, um, you know, more elaborate markings, more elaborate uh, uh, structures, mm -hmm. scalability structures. Um, so I'll, I'll send an email to the list about what the issues are, but um, all the other points are, are mostly editorial, so <clears throat> I don't think they really need any discussion. As I said, anybody who had working with us call comments, please look at this to make sure your comments were addressed successfully. And I think that's the end of the chair slides. So, how does this work? Right. And what's up next is a the CC feedback. What's that? But uh, got on time. Got to, yeah, okay. no, it's it's more that we I thought we'd actually talk about actual working group documents before we talk about right. you know future architectures. We can do that. Yeah, the pink box seems to have turned into a pink cross, which I'm not sure is an improvement. All right. Um, so, hi. Uh, I'm uh, Colin Perkins. Uh, I'm going to talk about the congestion control feedback. So this is a, a joint draft with Zahed, Varun, and Michael, um, but none of the co-authors have seen these slides and commented, so this is entirely my fault, and blame me for anything that happens. Or possibly mine, because... Or possibly yours, yes. Um, so um, we, we have the... The problem with the pink box is that you can't see the slides from it. Um, Here, you, you, you see that. 
No, that's no. a completely blank screen. Oh, yeah, we should have them just available. Too. Yes. Um, so, so we have the congestion control feedback draft, um, which uh, we've discussed a bunch of times. This is the, the outline of the format. Um, I think the only ch change which is going to happen is that the NSEC plus one is going to turn into a length field at, at some point. I think we discussed that at the last meeting. Um, Jonathan and, uh, what was it, Neil? And um, I think we had someone remote, Sergio, Sergio remotely. Uh, we're trying to implement this at the hackathon uh, over the weekend. Uh, and Jonathan sent some feedback based on his experiences, implement, or, or I guess their experience. Their experience well, my, my email was entirely at mine, basically. Okay, yes. Um, so what, what I've got in the rest of these slides is basically Jonathan's email copy-pasted into a bunch of slides with some discussion points, so we can try and uh, figure out what to do about uh, the, those comments, since we're all in the room. Um, so the, the first uh, issue Jonathan raised was that the parsing of the, the feedback packets is a little odd in that the only way you can tell if you've got to the end of the packet is that you only have four bytes left. Uh, and there's no actual count of the number of feedback uh, re reports in these packets. Um, you've got an SSRC and a bunch of report blocks, then an SSRC and a bunch of reports. Then you just realize you've just got the time stub left, and that means you, you, you've got to the end. And this is you know, it's, it's unambiguous to pass, but it's a bit weird, and it's uh, perhaps a little bit of a nuisance. Um, the problem is there's not actually a lot of space for a report count. Right? We, we could stick one at the beginning of the packets. Um, that com uh, A, misaligns everything, and is ugly. And I think it also conflicts with the standard for congestion control feedback packets, which wants the SSRCs and everything lined up. So that would be gross, but we could do it if we needed to. Um, we could maybe um, shrink this report timestamp field and put a report count in the very last offset, in the very last octet, which would also be ugly, but perhaps in a different way. Or we could just not worry about it and say that passing is going to be a little bit awkward, but who cares? Jonathan uh, um, Lennox as an individual, I would be inclined to say the latter, but point out in the draft that Parsing is a little awkward, so this is what you have to do. Yes, yes. Um, the, the advantage of putting it in the last octet is that one of the comments later is that the um, report timestamp field is um, not has too much precision anyway. So, we, so we, we probably can spare the bits to, to save a bite, a bite there. Uh, but it maybe isn't worth the trouble. I don't know. Don't, anyone else has opinions? It's all my as the other one who, who tried to implement that at the hackathon. I agree, it's like a little bit awkward, but I wouldn't bother too much about it. It's, okay. I mean, like you, your while loop is like instead of saying like while greater zero is like while greater, however you count the bits basically. Yeah, while well, well, length remaining is different to four or whatever. Yeah, exactly. yeah greater so. than four. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, I guess the outcome for this is that we leave it as it is. Yeah, with possibly some additional explanatory. Add some text, yeah. OK. All right, um, timing. Um, so the current version of the draft says um, that the timestamps used um, for the report type, that the clock used for the report timestamp is derived from the same clock used to generate the NTP timestamp in SR packets. Um, and uh, it seems Jonathan is not desperately thrilled by that choice. Um, so this was a change made fairly recently in that pre previous versions of the draft didn't specify what clock was used. Um, and we obviously need to specify something. Um, and I f thought the NTP timestamp format was a good format, and that since we had a clock specified for sender reports, it was easier to reuse that. Um, I certainly think the timestamp format is a good one, whether we need to specify that it's the same clock or just a stable clock running at the requisite rate. Um, if, people, if people think a different clock or any clock at the rate is used, I don't know. Uh, I, I thought it was useful that we have an unambiguous reference to which clock to use, but maybe that doesn't actually matter in, in practice. Um, I, I don't think it makes sense to use the media timestamp here, so, since there are a bunch of different clock rates. I think we want something more consistent than that. Yeah, um, especially because you have to be consistent across sources. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so it needs to be some sort of wall clock. Um, 
if we want to decouple it from the clock we use for sender reports, I, I don't object, but we need to specify what clock we do use. Yeah. So, um, uh, again, as an individual, I don't, I'm not going to be standing up because yeah, yeah. there's a lot of stuff on the cables. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my main concern is that, you know, typically your NTP timestamp will come from something like the POSIX clock real time, if people are familiar with that, which is basically get time of day. Whereas for send timestamp, which is thus, you know, subject to adjustments as, you know, NTP kicks in or, um, you know, somebody discovers their clock is off if they're not NTP synced or things like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas typically for, um, for feedback, you want something much more like clock monotonic, which is not have any sort of Synced to anything in specific, but will um, you know be much more stable? It's, it's on most platforms. It's just usually just uptime since since boot. Magnus, uh, Magnus Westland. Yeah, it seems reasonable to specify that this is stable, and maybe we could even reference some of the clock formats that actually would work in, for example, the clock source document, etc. Or if I mean. Yeah, I mean, we want a stable clock for NT for the sender reports as well. Otherwise, yeah. the lip sync goes off. Maybe this is a bigger problem with sender report timestamps. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I I think it's it would be sufficient here to maybe point out that for using a clock that has any kind of clock adjustment. Uh, is it has this downside that may results in the discontinuities in in the in the time measurements here. So, and and maybe recommend just recommend saying choose a clock that doesn't have this property, and and that should be sufficient for this document. But yes. maybe we can even reference some of the reasonable clock formats if they're available, based on the clock source draft. So, um, if if you have any suggestions for text, that would be appreciated. And if not, I can just say, well, it should be a stable wall clock you know, in wall NTP clock format. Well, so, something counting, you know, the, the actual yeah. sort of time of day uh, in, in whatever so the format NTP clock, is. I think that means, you know, this is current UTC time. Yes. Which is not what you want. You don't it, need. It doesn't have to say this. This clock doesn't have to say that it's currently, you know, November 2018. It just um, has to be well, it, it does if we're using the NTP format. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be accurate. Well, what does accurate mean? If I'm counting, if I say that it's you know January first, nineteen seventy, and instead, because I'm counting from. No. Yeah. That, well, the, the, I mean, this this is why I I, I lined yeah. it to the SR timestamp because it, it's unambiguous for what it should be. Or, but yeah, I, I guess the, the main thing is there is there ever any interesting reason to correlate these timestamps to anything other than each other? I mean, did it, is there a reason why you want to be able to say when this feedback message was generated versus a send SR timestamp? Or is there, do these only need to be relative to other CC feedback messages? Um, I don't know. Um, my guess would be that people are going to, at some point, and for some random reason, decide to compare them with the the timing of all the other things which are timed. Even if uh, we don't think we can't think of a reason to do that now, but I yeah I, I don't have a reason why you would care about that currently. So, I guess open issue for now. Okay. All right. Um, Similarly, um, the since we're measuring the report timestamp in NTP timestamp format, this gives uh, 65,536 of a second as the clock unit, um, whereas the arrival time offset is in thousand and twenty fourths of a second, and clearly one is more precise than the other. Um, we could save some bits. We could adjust the timestamp format. I didn't think it was worth the effort to come out with a different timestamp format, but if people really care about the difference in precision, then, then we could change that.
Yeah, I mean, I basically just thought this is ugly and we're waste basically these six bits. It's 2 to the minus 16 for 2 to the minus 10, I think is the, yeah. the numbers. And basically, there's six wasted bits of data which don't give you any actual and useful information for the. And, and, and this is certainly true. Yes. Yeah. So it feels like we could do something better, but I don't have a specific suggestion. I mean, if I believe the previous versions of the draft basically had everything measured in milliseconds. Uh, yes. Right. Which both the yeah. absolute, both, both the report time and the absolute time. Yeah, I mean, we could count milliseconds since the start of the session or something. It's perhaps a little ambiguous what the start of the session is. Or milliseconds since, all, I mean, milliseconds since some arbitrary time, since yeah. some arbitrary time that's consistent among a given sender, but other than that, nobody, you don't care. Yeah, we, I mean, yeah, we could certainly do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure it matters. You know, if if, if we pick an arbitrary arbitrary time, we should be clear that it's it's arbitrary. Yes. But, uh, yeah. I'll allow this, John. Is it a point to stop messing with this? Yeah. I mean, uh, if we, I'd like to see changes stop at some point. Yeah. Yes. Uh, e equally, if people implementing it sort of uh, are having trouble implementing it, then we want to make make it easier to implement. It. But. Uh, I, I don't know. Is is, is this issue um, worth uh, revising the format, or should we just not care about those those bits? Nobody cares. All right. <laughs> okay. No action at this time. Leave, yeah. leave alone. Conclusion. No action. So leave as is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I could specify the last six bits as zero if you don't care, but you know, it doesn't matter. But I think it matters. Yeah. Um. Okay, uh, so what value should be used for the arrival time offset for packets that arrived after the report timestamp? Um, so I think this is the case where we have so many packets that we want we need to split the reports into two. Is that right? Or rather, so I mean, I think for this to happen, you have basically your reporting interval has to have gotten so long that you're overflowing the arrival time offset. Yes. So, so there are some there are some packets which you know have been received. Yeah. Um, but they don't fit in this particular report or something. No, they have, they they they. It's not that they don't confused. fit in the report. Yeah. It's that they, it's that their arrival time doesn't fit in the can't be represented in the arrival time offset. Uh, given that the arrival time offset is, uh, epsilon under eight seconds, this basically requires your reporting interval to have gone above eight seconds. So this is after the report time stamp. Yeah. Three. So basically, so this would what this would mean is that you know, you, so you, and and also things are inter packets reordered by more than eight seconds, essentially. This is packets which are in the future for a particular report. Right. So you have to use you at the time you get around generating the report, you discover some of the packets their arrival timestamps are more than eight seconds ago, so you need to generate two reports. So that no, that's not. But I think the conclusion is right anyway. Okay, right. <laughs> so yeah, we, we need to clarify exactly what's here so we can write the guidance. But I think it's uh, if, yeah, we mark them as not not received at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which that's related to this. It's related to this other point too. Okay, so the second point is um, what what actually is the timestamp in the what what actually is the report timestamp. Mm -hmm. Uh, and currently, it says the time instant when the packet was the report packet was generated. Um, hang on, yeah, I'm confused. Yeah, so this this is the same issue <laughs> as previously. That um, the time the report was so, if you discover that you can't represent, all, you know, you've got more than eight seconds of packets to report. Yes. So you have to, so one of them you have to pre pretend that you generated this report eight seconds ago, so that you can represent the arrival time offsets of the, of the oldest packets. Yes. Um, then the report time set will not be when the packet when this report was generated because that's now. Yes. But you're faking it as being eight seconds ago. Yes. So it's it's so it's as if so, and then you generated as if it was generated eight seconds ago, but then. It's, I think it's mostly just semantics of what the 
Yes, it's, right. It's, and, but the point is, you can't rely on this for things like RTT value, or, you know, RTT estimates or anything, because it's not. It's you know, this it's the time at which this report is true, not the, or this report was true, not the time at which. Not necessarily the time at which it was generated. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's pro what it probably wants to be is the time at which the last packet in the thing was received, such that the arrival time offset for the last packet is zero. It doesn't have to be. But, but that would be a clear and unambiguous definition. Yeah, but, but the, the tricky thing there is that because you're reporting over multiple sources, that means you have to scan all your sources before you can figure out what your... Yeah, yeah okay, yes. Yes. It, it, th there is a time which indicates the, the point at which you are reporting on. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily represent the time at which the packet was generated. I right. think that's the thing we need to be clear about. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Because it could be a time in the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody is other than any, me understand this? I'm not even sure the caller understands it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean neither. <laughs> So, so, so there is a report timestamp in the packet. So it currently says it is the time the packet was generated. Um, I think we decouple it from that. We say that it's it's the the report time. Yeah. It may be in the past. The, 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 you know, this is the, this was the state of the world as of this time. Yes. It, yes. It would typically be the time at which the packet is generated, but it may be a time in the past. Right. Uh, um, but the whole problem only arises for the scenario where you generate a report for the past. Yes. Yes. Otherwise, the assumption is always that this is like now. Yes, yes. but there, there's there's quarter cases where you have to generate something for the past yes. in order to correctly represent when very old packets arrive. So, so I, I guess actually what it may be is if you have more than one, if you have so many reports that you need to have more than one report packet, mm. then it may be a time in, you know, so some of them may have times in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Which which is rare and should only happen if things get reordered I mean, in weird ways, right. or either either things get reordered in weird ways, or <laughs> if your session your group size is huge and your RTCP bandwidth is small, such that your reporting interval gets really really long. Yeah, and it, and in that case, you might not even set the reporting timestamp to like in the eight seconds in the wall, but you was probably for like the the one where you generate it for more than eight seconds, you probably set the reporting timestamp. Right at the at the earliest possible time of the the, the extra packs you need to report, yeah, right? Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think we need to explain that there are odd corner cases where the you have many packets to report on and the intervals don't work where this may not be the extra generation time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. Overlapping reports. Um, Yes, yes. Um, so, so we, we, we need to um, just do, do the right thing uh, with very old packets and not report them as lost, but report them as being out of range if we can put them in. Yeah. So that's that's a, just a straightforward clarification. Um, okay, so, so we currently say that the consecutive reports should just be consecutive sequence number ranges and should not overlap. Um, Obviously, if you have a big outage, then you don't want to send a report on the last 10 billion packet or 10,000 packets, uh, yeah. which which were in the outage. So we need some words to say do something sensible if there's an outage, uh, and that's just a bit wordsmithing, I think. And then there's also this just because my email was sort of incoherent. There's also the converse case here that if you had packet, sometimes you'll actually get a slight overlap in reports if you had to say. Packet reordering right at the point you said a yeah, feedback. Sure. You want to actually go back and say, "Hey, yeah, so pre I, pre I previously reported through packet seven, saying packet six was lost. Now I'm reporting saying packet six arrived, and yeah, packet seven still arrived, and yeah. that's the same time." So, yeah, before. so there's some overlap. Yeah. 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 Okay. So again, that's just a, a clarification mm -hmm. uh, of exactly what to do in a bunch of corner cases. Yeah. yeah. Um, reports on duplicates, if you get a packet and if you get multiple copies of a packet, which one should you report on? I suspect it doesn't matter. My my gut feeling will be to say we report on the last copy of the packet received, but if you want to make it first, I don't care. Yeah, I mean, I think last is probably... M most recently received yeah. packet. And, with it, and in particular, if you yeah. happen to get a duplicate packet, after you know you report on a packet 
then you get a duplicate of it again after you set the report. You should send probably send an updated report with the new arrival time in the next report. In the next report, yeah. yeah. Which will again have an overlap period, though. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, Did you were you segmenting already? Or? So you report it also in the second one. Yeah. With the previous time. No, with the new timestamp. With, with the new yeah. timestamp. Well, uh, that was an idea. Um, from from the implementer's point of view, yeah, some of these things are, are confusing and weird, and it seems like we're just coming coming to you know making up answers that sort of make sense for an implementer. But I mean, the point of all this is for a congestion control implementer, and so I'm wondering if any of these decisions are actually impacting how the congestion control algorithm actually works. Like, do congestion controls expect feedback on duplicates, and do they expect accurate feedback on the duplicates? And if we make a decision about it, it's going to be the first or the last, wouldn't that impact their algorithms? Because um, they're using these these numbers to actually calculate the available bandwidth, right? Right. So probably we should bring this up in our MCAT also. And mm, yes. Some of, these, some of these more concrete issues. Like yeah. My guess would be that duplicates are rare enough that it doesn't make any real difference in practice. Uh, I suppose you might hit corner cases where that's not true. Oh, well, there's there's two, two reasons for duplicates. One is um, that, you know, you really do have the network replicating packets, which is pretty rare. Uh, the other is people who don't implement RTX properly and just respond to that by resetting the same packet. But hopefully we can convince them to stop doing that else. <laughs> Um, um, this is the one. The first. This is the one that actually made me think about. We really need to bring this up to the condition control implementers. The other ones may also be relevant, but this one it immediately struck me as that I, if I was implementing the condition control, I would want to know the first packet received because the deltas that I'm calculating, and and the 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 delivery offsets that I'm calculating, the duplicates are irrelevant to me. It's really the first one that because if you start giving me reports on the duplicates, those are going to probably skew my my calculations. So I think the earliest one is is the one that probably makes the most sense for a congestion control implementer. No, I mean you, you're right that we should probably bring it up for the congestion control people. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. Okay. Um, okay, which SSRCs do you report upon? Um, it currently says report on every SSRC that's being congestion controlled. Um, the issue is, of course, the re receiver can't tell which sources are being congestion controlled. So you should probably just say report on every active SSRC. Okay, that one's easy. Um, signaling um, RTCP feedback SDP negotiation allows you to limit feedback to a subset of payload types. Should that be allowed for congestion control feedback? Um, well, I hadn't realized it did that. Um, I only realized this because when I went to try to interoperate with Nils, he set the signaling that way. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I can imagine weird corner cases, like, for example, if you're sending um, variable bitrate video along with low rate, constant bitrate audio, you possibly don't care about reporting on the audio for congestion control because you can't congestion control it anyway. The only congestion control is just to stop sending it. Oh, and, and, you know, if, if you have 10 kilobits of audio and 5 megabits of video, <laughs> who cares about the audio yeah. congestion control? So m maybe you might want to do that. But it's yeah, I mean, in the case. You know, I think in this case, it's, it's um, this should apply to your RTP transport, not to the actual codec, right? Yeah. This is agnostic of the codec. But, yes, but the, 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 the RTCP feedback uh, specification is. I mean, yeah, you showed me like the implementation with star, I guess. I mean, the, yeah. the question is if that needs to be uh, uh, written uh, down here in the draft to say like it always needs to be happen with, for all the codecs you're offering. I, I mean, I, I can certainly imagine cases where you have codecs which you can't congestion control. And there's that, no points but, only congestion control feedback for. Well, no, because you can still then, you can't, may not be able to congestion control those, but you know, you'd still, you still know how much congestion there is on this whole session and you take away the bad, you take away bits from the things you can congestion control. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But, but you, you know, I mean, you know, again, if, if you're sending video uh, and you have um, a, a very low rate text channel or something, yeah. then why bother sending congestion control the feedback hand, for the, the subtitles? Because they ain't uh, make any difference. Hello, Alvastram. And the we, reason we started out on this stuff was because we needed transport wide congestion control. Uh, implementing the mechanism 
in such a way that you can usefully use feedback on only a few uh, packet types in the session is going to be severely complicating impl implementations and make it less useful for what we set out to do. So I'd strongly, 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 at least strongly, <laughs> suggest so that we just say report for everything all the time. Yeah. Don't and implementers should not have to care about the case where you, you the, the implementers of the of the sending feedback should not have to care what uh, what the other side uh, does with it. That's the whole point. Yes. I mean, and the sender has to sort out. Yes, I'm getting uh, pa packet loss, uh, and now I have to allocate bandwidth between the text channel and the audio channel and a video channel. That's the sender's problem. Sure, but but it's the sender's problem in this case as well. Uh, yes, but the, if, the if you... Send, which it, sources to send feedback on? The, no, if, if the... The sender... If the sender is only able to say, or to say, I want feedback on everything, uh, then the receiver only has to implement support for sending feedback on everything. Uh, what we're not saying is the, fee that the receiver has to care what the sender is doing or which source yeah. is being congestion controlled. Well, no. All this is saying is you, you've some some streams you just omit the reports. So. I mean, the so problem is not per stream; it's per payload, per payload type, type, which is particularly yeah. annoying because sources can interleave payload types, and that gets really complicated. Okay. I mean, if you if you specify for some uh, media sections and not others, well, that's a thing something you can do with yeah. it. With, with SDP, that's sad, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I think you should. I, I think that uh, the the use case we definitely want to support is congestion control for the, for a whole transport, and anything that makes that life more complicated for implementers should go away until unless it's a, it has a compelling use case. Okay, so we just specify that. Do you have to specify all payload types? Yes. Yeah. yeah, and if you. Uh, Neil Tomer, and if you, if we agree on doing that, then I would suggest that you that to make it life easier for implementers to mandate that you basically use this in STP with uh, RTCP feedback star to avoid the situation that what I basically sent Jonathan was the list of like here are all the payload types, and I'm listing it on all on one because if we allow that, then you actually need to require from the implementers to go through all the payload types and ensure that it's actually turned on for all of them. And handle the corner cases of like what happens if it's not implemented, not offered on one of them. So I think the easiest solution then is to just say like it has to be done with star. Okay. The end of story. Okay. Sure. That makes sense. Mosinati. So as a consequence of this, this means that uh, all retransmission formats and fact formats would also uh, be mandated to give feedback. The receivers would have to feedback. For every RTX yeah. or, or that, that would be a consequence of it, yeah. Okay. Unless you did them in a separate section, so yeah. I mean, we need to figure out. I mean, separate separate section is a whole other thing. But I mean, I think you want that because you want to get feedback. Because again, it's you're getting you want to figure out how much total stuff is getting through on the session, and obviously, what's what's experiencing congestion? Which particular SRCs experience the congestion does not have to be which SRCs. You adjust, you know, to reduce your, or increase your bandwidth. It's entirely up to the sender how those associate. But I think, yeah, I think actually sending the feedback for the all the repair flows also is absolutely what we want. It, it, it may be worth explicitly calling that out because that may not be obvious to an implementer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Um, yes, we should fix the editorial nets. Okay. I'm done. Thank okay, you. Great. Thank you. And. Which one, who do we have next, Bernard? Uh, Bernard, yeah. Bernard, okay, so Bernard, if you want to get in the queue, so you can talk. Can you hear us? Uh, there we are. And let me get, oh, that's yeah. this one, right? No, not that one. It's uh, oh, RDB it's over, guard GPU. RDB over. Quick quality collection, this uh, one. Modified. Quick quality collection, right. Yeah. So can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Uh, <laughs> this is a presentation about quick multiplexing. It's a follow-on to a presentation that Colin made at ITF 100. So we're going to give you an update on where we are and what I'd like to recommend the group do from here. Next slide. 
Okay, so just recapping the problem, uh, Quick is potentially attractive as a peer-to-peer -peer data exchange mechanism for WebRTC applications. Uh, primarily, that is reliable transport, which is defined in the current Quick transport document, but there have been some interest in unreliable transport for things like games or potentially media, um, and people are proposing um, unreliable uh, datagram extensions to Quick. WebRTC applications almost always multiplex today, and that's RTP, RTCP, Sun, and DTLS all on the same socket, very, very popular. That's currently documented in their RFC 7983. So in terms of solutions, multiplexing of Sun is absolutely required because otherwise you'd have to reinvent some equivalent mechanism to do peer-to-peer. Um, multiplexing with DTLS, SRTP, and SRTCP uh, is required if you're going to do uh, use RTP, SRTP, and SRTCP alongside Quick. Um, and if you can do that, you get also the ability to mix Quick and the, the SRTP, DTLS, UDP data channel as well. Next slide. So some non-requirements are support for turn channel multiplexing. Uh, that's an optimization which I believe is not supported in any WebRTC implementation where you have a four octet prefix instead of the standard 36 octet stun overhead. Also, ZRTP is used in WebRTC as far as I know, and that's an alternate key exchange mechanism. So we don't require that these uh, actually work, although it's okay if they don't break them. Thanks. So a little bit of a recap of past events. On March 2017, Colin Perkins and Lars Egert first noted compatibility of Quick with RFC 7093 and filed an issue. Uh, in November of 2017 at ITF 100, Colin uh, presented to ITF uh, to AVG Core a uh, potential solution. On November 29th, that solution was uh, proposed as a PR and merged into Quick Transport 08. Um, and subsequently in December, a PR to undo the changes was rejected. Um, and as I'll describe, Quick has evolved since then um, and so the solution proposed by Colin has changed a bit, um, and we'll talk about some of the implications of that next. So this was the demultiplex proposed at ITF 100. Um, the main differences here are that there's potentially um, some overlap between Quick and the turn channel, but as I mentioned, that isn't really consequential because WebRTC implementations really don't support the turn channel. Um, and then Quick is also in the range 250 to 255, which is the long header. Um, so basically, this this meets all the requirements and some things that were non-requirements, like not conflicting with ZRTP. Um, next. Okay. Now, a few words about the uh, DTLS allocation here. It's important to understand that. Currently, DTLS does not use anywhere near the full allocation. As you can see, this is the IANA table. Um, and for DTLS, uh, the requires coordination, which means a potential conflict with 7983 is in the 0 to 19 and the 64 to 255 range. But um, 25 to 63 are currently unassigned. Um, 25 will be assigned by DTLS 1.3, but basically a large portion of the DTLS space from like uh, 26 to 63 is currently unassigned. Um, so that's something to keep in mind in the slides uh, that follow. Next. So since uh, the presentation of ITF 100, the idea of using Quick and WebRTC has gained some traction. We have a JavaScript API spec on their active development in W3C. Uh, it's matured a lot uh, from implementation experience and has been following the Quick Transport doc um, adding support for unidirectional streams, as an example, um, and lots of lots of interest in it. Um, and some implementations are coming. Uh, there's been an intent to implement filed. There are people experimenting potentially with additional scenarios like carriage of media. Um, so, so quite a bit of interest here. Next. So. Why can't we declare victory? At ITF 100, we basically said we would document this purely in the quick spec 
Um, what's wrong with that? Well, history shows that if you have an undocumented algorithm or agreement, something is likely to go wrong over time. Um, one of the things that can go wrong is if you don't document, document requirements in the IANA registries, like what we have for DTLS, someone could assign a code point and step on something without realizing it. Another problem is that, um, and I think more relevant here, is that if you have an undocumented algorithm, it's likely, particularly one that changes with different drafts of Quick, it's likely to exhibit interoperability problems. And as I'll describe, the uh, propo original proposal from ITF 100 needs to change a bit. And if we don't write this down, eventually some developer is going to find some old set of slides, go implement it, and something bad will happen. Um, and that's particularly true since we have trials of, uh, approaching with this. Um, and once those are out, people will start to depend on multiplexing. Um, you've got WebRTC, which is being deployed all over the place, 700 applications, 1.5 billion users. So it's very easy for somebody to get out in the wild and be very difficult to recall um, if it's broken. And so at this point, if there are problems with multi support, that would have consequences. Um, and I believe I'll try to make the argument that uh, we need a, to document this in an RFC uh, 7983 disk just so developers know how it all works. Um, we also go over it very carefully and understand exactly what we're telling them to do um, and go through the normal process. Next. So this was particularly brought home to me in going over um, the transport draft version 16 and comparing it to the 08 and trying to figure out what changes were needed in the demultiplex algorithm. Um, the long header didn't change, and the type values, uh, field values are pretty much the same. So that was more or less as it was in Colin's presentation. So at least that part is good. Next slide. But um, I noticed a few things that uh, I had to scratch my head about. Uh, one is that there's a stateless reset packet um, with a key phase bit. So the, the actual short header has changed. There was a C bit in it that we talked about at ITF 100. It's now a K bit for key phase. Um, and this brings up the possibility of potential overlap with DTLS, um, namely code point 48. As I described earlier, it's not actually, 48 is not actually an allocated DTLS code point. So uh, even with DTLS 1.3, nothing bad would happen there, but it, but it does uh, impinge upon the DTLS space as allocated in RC 7983. Next. So the short packet header uh, header uh, has also changed. And there, um, there's now a K bit and some R bits, which are set randomly. That generates code point values 48 to 55 with a potential overlap with DTLS. Uh, for a K value of 1, that's in the range 112 to 119, which was taken into account um, in the previous ITF 100 proposal. So that's not an issue. But again, we have this potential overlap uh, with DTLS which is not documented in our currently in RFC 7983. Next. Uh, and finally, there is a version negotiation packet that's in section 17.4, um, which has a the high order bit set to one, and then a bunch of unused bits which are set randomly in the server, and that generates values 128 to 255, which can overlap with RTP and RTCP. Um, that's not a big problem because if the version field here, the next 32 bits, will be zero for quick. Um, so you can check that and realize that it is not, in fact, uh, RTP and RTCP. Uh, it's a quick packet. Um, but that fact was also uh, is not something that's in 7093 or in the IGF-100 proposal. Okay. So based on what I've uh, just shown you, Here's what I think the revised demultiplex proposal looks like. And again, this is something I think it has to be double or triple checked, but here's where I, where I think it, it ends up, um, which is uh, pretty similar to what came before, except that code points 48 to 55 would be forwarded to quick. Um, that would be from the short header. Um, you'd get 112 to 119, also from the short header, potentially, for, for different values of the K bit. Um, you would forward 128 to 191 to RTP and RTCP, but only if the version field the next 32 bits was not zero. Um, and then I think 250 to 255 would still go to quick, and that's the long header. Um, so a little bit different from what we had at ITF 100. I think still workable, um, but a little a uh, little bit different, and also um, some additional checks that have to be done 
uh, from what we had there. You can't just look at the first octet. Hey, Bernard. Next. Yeah. Uh, Mozanetti, well, one question on the uh, version check. Uh, so wouldn't that overlap with the timestamp in RTP? It would. Was, was timestamp zero invalid or somewhere uh, no, becoming invalid? Zero is valid. So, so what, what, how, is, how is that? Uh, it's a pretty poor heuristic, uh, I think, if uh, <laughs> yeah. to rely on. Yeah, so, uh, uh, good, good, point, good point, Mo. This is why I think we'd have to discuss this. <laughs> To, to double double check this, I think that yeah, there would be uh, if you potentially had a, a timestamp of zero, um, you could make a mistake. There might be something else we would have to look at in that case. Um, I guess the point I'm trying to make here, Mo, is that uh, this is worth documenting and reviewing in the ITF rather than leaving this uh, to folklore. Uh, absolutely. For, those, for yeah. that exact reason. Um, yeah. and, and one 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 other question. So uh, uh, sorry, I I forgot where things landed on the multiplexing draft. I thought there was discussion of squeezing the turn range to something much narrower. That didn't happen. It's still the full range in the in the multiplexing draft, in the RTP multiplexing draft. I thought there was uh, talk of, of squeezing the turn range into something very narrow, even narrower than this yeah. in this 64 okay. 79. Well, um, I don't recall that. That's certainly something that that again, if we had a draft to actually talk about, we could we could do, um, and might well be worthwhile. Um, so I guess that would be another reason to actually have a document and, and put it through the process so that we, we look at it and understand exactly where uh, where we stand. Hey, John, thanks. I mean, I, I thought that at some point we said that, I mean, turn needs to be demuxed from, the turn channels need to be demuxed from stun, but other than that, you always know, is this a packet coming from your turn server or not? Because, you know, yeah, that's the, true as well. If the IPM port is coming from your turn server, you treat it as turn or stun. Otherwise, you don't. It can't be a turn channel. So I think I think yeah. that's a separate, separable problem. Um, so the comment I was going to make, sort of the general comment, Bernard, is that well, uh, well just, just so, I, so I, I think the the problem here is that we're thinking about it only from one entity's viewpoint, mm -hmm. and there's maybe multiple entities that are concerned about this, and and want to do like it may not actually be the receiver that that cares about this. There may be you know, stateful boxes on the path that, you know, that, that also want to understand what this is. And so if they, you know, now they have to know what the turn server, you know, uh, IP and port is to, you know, in order to know that it's turn. Um, so I think this adds a, a layer of complexity for, for demuxers that aren't necessarily the final receiver. So I think it's yeah. better if we had a turn range that's well-defined mm -hmm. that fits narrowly within you know, the quick and RTP, RT speed, DTLS, DMUX strategy. Yeah. That'd be preferable to me. I, I think to your point is that nothing I've shown here would make that impossible. Um, yeah, I was actually surprised that turn was still allowed 64 to 79. I thought I thought it got, I thought it was already squeezed down to something. Yeah, well, again, I, I probably have to triple check the, the quick document, but my understanding is that there, the overlap there has been reduced. Um, but again, it's, it requires triple and quadruple checking to make sure we, we understand all the ranges yeah. that can be done here. I think the most important thing is we need to update the multiplexing draft to say that quick is RTP v3. And or, or, or something. <laughs> well, that, that's a whole other thing which we'll talk about in the next next presentation. But um, um, next, yeah. Yeah, so um, I, what I was going to say is I feel like quick sort of had, there's, there's what the current quick v2, I guess they're calling it now, is doing, and then there's what Quick is guaranteeing for the future, which is the wire image. And I feel like this needs to be more. What is the wire image guaranteeing? Which might mean we need to talk to. I guess that's Martin Thompson about to sort of say, what is he willing to say that Quick is going to guarantee, not just in this version, but in all future versions of Quick. So in general, the the agreement was that we were only talking about Quick version one because. By definition, uh, the quick version numbers, if you go to a different version, negotiate a different version, you can change almost anything. Mm. Um, so, um, and I think the, the thinking was basically that, that in version two, you know, who knows what it could do. So you can't really, uh, you know, make absolute promises about it. But so that, so my recommendation would be to just try to document what goes on in quick V1, maybe not call it quick, but just quick version one and make that clear. Mm -hmm. um, so that we would understand exactly what uh, you know what the promise was, but I think that's also one of the arguments for documenting something. If you write something down, 
then everyone knows exactly what you're agreeing to do or not uh, agreeing to do um, and what exactly the advice is. My, my overall impression from reviewing Transport 16 was that just leaving this as folklore would be potentially very dangerous, like leaving a gun around that someone could shoot themselves in the foot with. Um, and also, in particular, there might be changes to the TLS content type registry, for example, to cite values 48 to 55, which have overlap as requiring coordination in RFC 7983 this. Um, not that they're likely to get allocated anytime soon, but just to make it clear what the status is. Uh, All right, so um, do people agree this is worth doing? And I guess since 7983 was ABT Chorus, we should take it on as well, even though obviously there's a coordination across a wide variety with the AITF. Um, and are the people who gave this presentation willing to be to submit a, a, a draft to do a, or the authors of 1983 or whatever, submit a draft updating this, Bernard and Colin. Uh, I, I'm willing to do it. Uh, I don't know if Colin's here, so I'll let him speak for himself. All right. uh, Colin Peggins, I, I don't have time to lead it, but I will certainly help if someone else right. is leading the effort. So my advice would be submit a draft for, I guess Prague is the next meeting, and then, or even or even sooner, we don't have to do everything in meetings, but submit a draft and we will take a look and decide at that, once we have a draft to look at, whether we want to adopt it as a work item to do the best. Any okay. disagreements? All right. Thank you. All right. Do we have to continue? Are we, are we out of time? Yeah. Oh, we're out of time, so. Uh, I guess you argue you don't get to talk after all, but <laughs> if you want to give yeah, a very I'm quick doing. sort of okay, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I really want to be quick. Yeah, that works. Uh, no, no, this one. Okay. Yes. So this way so, you can. I don't have to ask you to change slides for you. Okay. Um, I'll try to see if I can operate this one. Okay, so hi, I'm Jörg. Uh, this is a very quick heads up that of a, about a piece of work that Colin and I put together in response to all the um, ad hoc engineering work that has been going around around RTP and Quick and running real time streams over over Quick. So this came from a, from a paper we submitted to a workshop that's going to be published in December. There's an we, we submit we sent this to the. E to the mailing list and suddenly people came to us and said, oh, don't you want to say something in, in ABT core? Uh, so here we are, this is why we don't have a draft yet. There's going to be one at some point, hopefully not, not too distant point in the future. Um, the, the main observation is that many people have been looking at different flavors of running RTP over quick. We are guilty of, uh, of, of a draft of the, outlining some of the ideas ourselves. Um, but quite a bit of these have been done more or less in an, in an ad hoc fashion. Um, streaming media probably works reasonably well, but interactive media, we had all kinds of different uh, suggestions in the past. This is surely not an exhaustive list, for, ranging from mapping each video frame in a, uh, in a conversation to an individual quick stream, uh, so opening 30 frames per second or something like that, um, or 30, 30 streams per second. Um, to avoid per, um, persistent retransmissions because the, the, the video data might get stale at some point. Um, limiting retransmissions at some point, then we have most recently a datagram proposal that doesn't do anything but just emulates UDP over quick, with a little bit of a framing uh, over the quick streams. And what we did is we wanted to take a step back and actually look back at what, R what RTP has been doing. And so we came up with this paper, which has a good reason because doing, oh, it doesn't advance anymore. No, uh, no I think somehow you have, there's something very, yeah, there's something weird about the, how the slides got converted, I think. Let me see if I can. Just, just, just scroll to the next one. Um, so one of the, One of the reasons that we didn't start off with an ID is because you can't really do so really sophisticated tables in um, in ASCII art so easily. Uh, it might be truncated. Wrong with it. 
Okay, so in the slides that will be there, there is a table with 21 features that describe what RTP has been doing, how this is current, how this could be addressed on top of Quick, and how that could in the end be. Um, well, this, but the, the fourth slide is here. Why is the fourth one here, but not the third, or the, the last one, but not the one before? Anyway, so we have a big table. Yeah, there's a table. I oh, see I think, it. I think maybe it's just there's something about the slide which is taking a very long time for it to render. Oh, it's PDF and PowerPoint. Who? Oh, yeah, maybe it can really use funny fonts, and so it's trying to. Whatever. Times Roman isn't a funny font. I don't know. Anyway. Oh, uh, so anyway, so you get know. the idea. We we went through a bunch of different properties that uh, are you free features that RTP provides. Looked at how this could be mapped into Quick and how one could Sorry. put this into <laughs> a. I tried to pull screen up. Sorry. No, yeah, don't worry. Anyway, um, it's too long to go through this anyway, so take a look at, um, at, at, at that paper, at that table. Um, out of this analysis, we try to come up with a minimal feature set that one could use as a straw man proposal on how to co-evolve RTP and Quick. Next, uh, now I can probably advance. And we call these RT streams that have minimal ADU sequence numbering rather, rather than uh, byte offsets. Um, we have media-specific timestamps, as we know from RTP, um, ways to control retransmissions on a per-channel fine-grained basis, and then we have more detailed reception reporting, which is what we figured would be the useful common transport layer features that are worthwhile adding to Quick. We also have a wall talk, wall, wall clock time synchronization for interest, interest stream, what RTCP usually does, by, by means of a separate uh, method, a packet type, and then we push all the rest to the application layer. Um, the nice thing about this is that most of these things are optional, so if you leave out everything, you, this reduces nicely to the datagram style service that we have right now, except that it doesn't use this the strange framing. Um, so this is a heads up, um, because we, we feel that um, probably quite a few endpoints will be implementing quick, and they will also want to do real-time at some point, and so we want to come up with something that makes sense. Uh, in the long run, we're going to have some discussion around this topic at some point. Thanks. Questions? We don't really have time for questions, so. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all, and. Uh, see you in Prague. See you in Prague, and around the meeting. <laughs> anybody didn't get a blue sheet? Blue sheet? Blue sheet, anybody? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.